Okay. So chapter 10 was pretty, pretty short. Um, so I included a lot of examples instead. Um, aside from that, I'm going to show um, HTTP methods, uh, Postman, Chrome Dev Tools, the Post cool stuff. Postman. The cool stuff. Just so Postman is the coolest thing ever. Yeah, so that we good, have good examples. Let's start first with our textbook. Uh, application layer, again, is the topmost layer. Um, it's the layer where actual communication is initiated and it uses the services of transport layer, network layer, data link layer, and the physical layer. Okay, And there's two remote app application process can be done. Uh, one is peer-to-peer -peer, and the other one is client-server. Peer-to-peer, it means that there's two processes that are executing at the same level and they exchange data using some shared resources. And it would look like this. So your computer to, let's say, his computer is sharing data. And the best example for that one when I was growing up is basically LimeWire. I don't know if it's super popular here, but it was super popular in the Philippines back then. Exactly. Yep. And a lot of virus as well. <laughs> the Rick Ross thing where you're like, I know. Uh, Rick Rolling? Yeah, Rick Rolling. Yeah. <laughs> Skype is another one. Uh, it's a video conferencing or messaging. Skype is dead. Yeah, it's becoming dead. Uh, Boeing uses it still. My, my friend is a, is a PE at Microsoft, and there he works with uh, some of the uh, integrations for mm -hmm. the Bing team. And uh, the Microsoft Teams uh, group has put out internally that like we are we have no intention of integrating Skype with Teams. Yeah, they're they're done. It's 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 gonna die. Yeah, I think Teams right now has a good video conferencing feature. It's so easy to just click loads. The thing that blur bothers yeah. me about it is that like people register with their email addresses, mm -hmm. but there's no button where I can say like, hey, send this person an email. There's there's no, no like, hey, send this person a, a direct message, like when you're, in a, when you're in a meeting or something. Yeah, sure. Client server is basically the process that there's a client requesting some resource from other process that is acting as the server that is providing the service. Uh, you've been doing this every day in your life, when you use your computer, that's your client, and you request something over the internet, and then when you get something back, let's say your Facebook page, that's basically the server responding and giving you those uh, um, HTML file, JavaScript file for you to see, okay? And the simplest model looks like this. In any devices, you basically communicate with the server and most of the time as well, there's other uh, servers or um, devices in between that, okay? And we do have a diff different application layer protocols. We touched some of them. Uh, DHCP, DNS, FTP, HTTP, and HTTPS, SMTP, SNMP. So we'll start with dynamic host configuration protocol. And again, this is the, the one that assigns IP addresses to your device. You can do it, uh, it does that automatically. It leases an IP address to your device. Uh, it also provides all related configuration information such as subnet mass and default gateway. And the port number used for this one is 546 for the client and 547 for the server. So prior to having this DHCP, uh, unique IP addresses were manually assigned by, again, network administrators. And assigning a host to subnet by defining its default gateway. And when the host, the device, moves to a new location, the network configuration must be updated manually. Okay? And the first, the basic steps in obtaining your IP address is basically DORA. DORA the Explorer. Uh, discovery, offer, request, acknowledgement. So it kind of looks like this. You have your DHCP client. First, doing the 
IP address request, which is the discover. The HTTP server then would now uh, offer an IP address, keyword offer. The HTTP client would now request again for IP address selection. And the DHCP server would now uh, give back an acknowledgement for that IP address. First, discovery. Uh, an example would be, let's say the client computer broadcasts message on the physical subnet to discover available DHCP server. <coughs> it looks for the server, okay? This client computers create a user datagram protocol packet with the default broadcast destination of the 255.255.255.255 or the specific subnet broadcast address if any configured. Okay, first it looks for the DHC server and tries to connect with that. Next, uh, the server would now offer, right? When a DHCP server receives an IP lease request, hey, give me an IP from my client, it reserves an IP address for the client and extends an IP lease over by, ex by sending a DHCP offer message to the client. This message contains the client's MAC address, the IP address that the server is offering, subnet mass, lease duration, IP address of the DHC server making the offer. So all of those uh, information. <coughs> Once it's done, the client again would now request. Again, first, in most companies, there are, let's say, two DHCP servers providing fault torrents of IP addressing. If one DHCP server fails or must be taken offline for maintenance, it's, it's so that the client could receive DHC offers from multiple DHCP servers. But it will only accept one DHCP offer in response to the offer client requesting the server. And furthermore, the client replies uh, with a DHCP request, basically a unicast to the server, uh, requesting the offered address based on the transaction ID field in the request. Servers are informed whose offer the client was accepted when other DHCP servers received this message. They withdraw any offers that they may have made to the client and return to the offered address to the pool of available address. Keyword here is, again, it has a pool of available addresses that it can um, request. In some cases, the HTTP request message is broadcast, again, for multiple DHCP servers, instead of being unicast to a particular DHCP server. Because the DHCP <coughs> client has still not received an IP address, this one-way message can let all other DHCP servers know that another server will be supplying the IP address without missing any of the servers with a series of unicast messages. And again, once that's done, the last step is the acknowledgement. When the DHCP server receives the DHCP request message from the client, the configuration process enters its final phase. This is called the acknowledgement phase. Sends a DHCP ACK packet to the client. This packet includes the lease duration and any other configuration information that the client might, might have requested, okay? And thus, the IP configuration process is complete. And inserting a muddiest point here, which type of IP address does DHCP assign, IPv4 or IPv6? It depends on your D DHCP. There's DHCP v4 and DHCP v6. <coughs> Next, file transfer protocol. Standard network protocol used to transfer computer files between two hosts on a computer network FTP is built on the client server model architecture and uses separate control and data connections between the client and the server. Port number for the data is 20 and the port number for the control is 21. And here, we'll try to illustrate this example between a human being first before showing an example for the computer systems. So in this example, we'll have a client named Carl Clinton who wishes to transfer his file from Acme Mail Service that manages his post office box. So the conversation or transaction would look something like this. Clinton would dial phone number for the mail service, something like that, and service would say, hello, this is the Acme <coughs> Mail Service. How may I help you? So Clinton would now introduce himself that gives his name, 
and I would like to access a certain mailbox number. And the server says, okay, sure, but first give me your password. And Clinton would say, here's my password, QXJ4Z2AF. And the service would now say, okay, you may proceed. And once he's uh, authorized, now the client or Clinton would say, oh, I'm only interested at looking bills and invoices. So look at the folder marked bills in my mailbox. And the service can just say, okay. And Clinton would say, oh, please prepare to have your assistant call my secretary <laughs> at my number. Service just says, okay. Next is, um, now call my secretary and tell him the name of all the items in the bills folder of my mailbox. Again, only one folder in that mailbox. Tell me when you have finished. Server would say, my assistant is calling your secretary now, and then um, give some update. My assistant has sent the names of the items. Now, Clinton would now receive the list from his secretary and notices a bill from Yo-Yo Dime Systems. Again, server says, okay. Clinton says, now fax me a copy of the bill from Yo-Yo Dime Systems. And server would say, assistant is calling your fax machine now. Assistant has finished faxing the item. Client, uh, Clinton says, thank you. Server says, goodbye. And that's the human to uh, postal example. Uh, now let's look at the same conversation, but this time uh, computer system communicating with FTP protocol over TCP IP connection. So client would just basically connect to the FTP service at port 21 on the IP address, given that. And then the server would just say, hello, this is Acme mail service. And client would provide the user ID. Server would now um, acknowledge that user ID and request for the password to grant access. Client would now send a password and it's encrypted. And we need to encrypt that so that we don't have, don't get any eavesdropping or man in the middle attack. Uh, server would now say, okay, password is good. You are now logged in. And client says, oh, I want to access a specific um, directory. It's called bills. And server would now return that directory, which is um, home slash mp 1234 bills. Again, these numbers, the 220 is um, this is status code meaning okay. 300 is a redirect. 200 plus, again, it's okay. 250 is okay. And then now client would receive um, this port. Sends the port number. Next would be server would say, okay, port command successful. And the client now requests for the list of files in the bills. Server would now respond with opening it. And server would say, oh, I've listed everything and it's completed. And client would now ask for another port number in the machine. Server would say, okay, port command successful. And client would say, I want to download the file text, which has the list. And server would say, okay, opening mode data connection for yoyodyne.txt. And server says, transfer complete. Client says, quit. Server says, goodbye. Okay. So again, when using FTP users, use FTP client programs rather than directly communicating with FTP server. Same example using the stop FTP program, which is usually installed with your Unix systems. Okay. Items the user types are in bold. So now this now looks like what you see in the terminal. And the user is the one typing the bold. So at first, it tries to connect with FTP. The uh, FTP is opened. And now um, it requests for that um, connection to the FTP server. Next would be asking for the name asking for the password, and then getting the response of your logged in because um, you're, you're granted access. And the client would now want to access a certain directory called bills. And now you've changed your directory, and ls is just list. And it lists all the available uh, uh, stuff in your bills directory, uh, files and folder, and now 
you would now connect and have the listing complete. Now you want to download that list with getyoyodyne.txt. After that, transfer complete, quit, and goodbye. So it's just like moving in your directory as well. Okay, this protocol is used to transfer an electronic mail from one user to another. It is a client server type of protocol with the port number 25. Okay, so let's assume there's two people, Bob and Alice. Let's say Bob has an email account at Gmail, bob at gmail.com. Alice has an email account at Yahoo, alice at yahoo.com. Let's say Bob wants to send an email to Alice. He composes a message on the application running on his Mac OS um, with the mail app of Apple, and he's ready to click send on that email. So first, we will have to define who are the players in that scenario. One, we have Bob's user agent. So this is the application running on Bob's laptop that he uses to compose, reply to, and read his email messages. He uses Apple's mail app as his user agent, okay? Uh, Bob wants to read his email messages. His user agent fetches them from Bob's mail. And if Bob wants to send an email, he composes the messages on the user agent, again, which is the Apple mail app and then pushes it to his mail server to be delivered to the right recipient. The second participating player we have is basically Bob's mail server, which is Bob's Gmail account. Uh, what this means is there's a remote machine under gmail.com domain that manages all the email messages <coughs> sent to Bob. This machine is also in charge of sending email messages sent from Bob to other users on other mail services. This remote machine is what we call Bob's mail server, okay? Again, we have Bob's user agent, which is the mail app, and Bob's mail server, which is Gmail. Now, we do have Alice user's agent. It's similar to what Bob has, but this time around, it's the application running on Alice's laptop. It allows her to fetch emails from her mail server to read. It allows her to compose messages as well on her laptop and push them over to the mail server to be later delivered to the proper recipient. So now, Alice has a PC instead of a Mac and she uses Microsoft Outlook as her user agent. So Alice has Microsoft Outlook as the user agent, and she also has a mail server. So if Bob's mail server was Gmail because of the gmail.com, Alice's mail server has a Yahoo mail server because she has a Yahoo account. It would look something like this. So Bob sends an email, uses the SMTP protocol, it goes to Bob's mail server, which is the gmail.com, and that communicates to another mail server, which is yahoo.com, and now the POP3 or IMAP would now be the protocol <coughs> to, uh, connect to the Alice user's agent. Again, user's agent are the applications that they're using for their mail. Okay, and this is the, how the, um, connections are done. Uh, it starts with one, sends an E-H-L-O message. Think of it like hello message. And uh, Alice mail server receives and responds with that with 250, meaning okay. Uh, now, the Bob's mail server would identify the sender to Alice SMTP server and gives this uh, mail from bob at gmail.com. Alice mail server checks if that um, email is okay, sends a 250 again. Now it sends another one, which is the recipient, Alice at yahoo.com. Recipient is okay, another 250. And then now Bob's mail server would start sending this, hey, I'm gonna start sending data. Are you ready? Mail server of Alice would say, yes, I'm ready. And once Bob's mail server receives that uh, 354, uh, now they can start sending email messages line by line until Alice mail server says, okay, um, I'm done. And Bob's mail server would say, quit. Alice mail server says, okay, and now connection is terminated. Next, simple network management protocol. Uh, it's basically a protocol that is used for collecting information from and configuring network devices such as servers, printers, hubs, switches, 
and routers in an IP network. The port number is 161. So with this one, they have features of providing read and write abilities. For example, you could use it to reset passwords remotely or reconfigure your IP addresses. You can also collect information on how much bandwidth is being used, collect error reports into a log useful for troubleshooting and identifying trends, email an alert when your server is low on this space. You can also monitor your server's CPU and memory use, alert when thresholds are exceeded, page or send an SMS text message when a device fails, and so forth. And it would look like this, that usually with your uh, SN, SNMP, you would have a management station that can give alerts to your user and manage your server, configure it, and also your network hardware. So some commands. Uh, we do have the get operation. Retrieve one or more values from a managed device, let's say a hardware. <coughs> get next is basically you retrieve the value of the next OID in the MIB tree. I'm not gonna show the MIB tree anymore. Uh, get bulk is to retrieve um, voluminous data, a lot of data from MIB table. Set, <coughs> modify or assign value of the managed data, and so forth. You have traps, inform, and response. So now we move on to domain name system, or sometimes they call it domain name service. It's usually used to resolve human readable host names into IP addresses. In particular, an email address such as xyz at uml.edu cannot be routed as it is. It needs to be mapped to an IP address, and this is the role of DNS. Uh, the goal of DNS is basically name resolution. And the port number for DNS is 53. Uh, it has a URL, a reference to the address of a resource on the internet. It has protocol identifier and resource name. The, the structure of the DNS kind of looks like a tree. You have a root on top, and you have generic and country codes, and all the .com, .org, .edu, .net under the generic. And again, on the country code, you have specific .us, .uk, .ng, .fr. So, as the user requests from an uh, IP address of uml.edu, it will go to the ISP, Internet Service Provider's DNS server. And now, the DNS server from that ISP would request the address of the .edu domain, and then where would it request first? It would request first to the DNS root server and then sends the IP address of the .edu domain. So this is the root. It first sends to the root at the very top. And then now it sends the IP address of the .edu domain, meaning it could now go to the generic and go to the .edu. And now it would now the ISP DNS server having that information would now request the IP address of the authoritative server for uml.edu, which is to the DNS server for the .edu domain. Gets that request, gives a response of the IP address of uml.edu, and now it could go to this UML and send back an IP address of uml.edu and gives that back to the user. Now it has that address. Again, this is a very simple format. For the user, you only see that uh, you request an IP and the ISP DNS server resolves that for you and you get the IP address. But most of the time, your machine already caches this um, DNS, like the IP address of the um, URL that you're accessing. So DNS zone is basically a contiguous portion of the DNS domain namespace over which a DNS server has authority. It can contain one or more contiguous domains and it has the primary zone, original source of data for all domains in the zone, 
and a second dire zone, which is the read-only copy of the zone that was copied from master server during the zone transfer. To have a quick analogy for that one is, um, let's create a, a company organization chart. And for this company, we would have uh, three different departments, which is HR, engineering, and marketing. And for HR, we have two units, the payroll and personal, and then underneath them, we have uh, uh, the employees themselves. So in the engineering department, we do have a unit called dev and testing. And for testing, we have one employee, and for dev, we have two more units, which is the web and mobile, and have employees underneath them. And the marketing has two employees. And let's say um, we have uh, Steve representing the company XYZ, which is the root, and Phil for HR, Stacy for engineering, and Chris for marketing. And this is trying to show an analogy with DNA zone. So this is an, a good example with, um, let's say someone called in company XYZ and they're asking for uh, a mobile developer named Sam. So Steve would take up the call and say, um, okay, I don't know where mobile dev is, the extension number, or in this case, the uh, port number or IP address, something like that. Uh, so what Steve does is he said, well, I know that mobile is part of uh, engineering department. So he ends up routing the call to the engineering department, which Stacy picks up. And when now Stacy picks up, he says, um, I also don't know where the mobile department is exactly, I mean the extension number, but I do know that it's part of the web the depart, uh, development department. So he routes the call to Stan and now Stan knows where uh, Sam's extension number is in the mobile department and now routes that, as, that call as well. So that's how like DNS zones are being used as well as you can see going back to this uh, three. It's like the root is the company XYZ. Let's say generic was the engineering team. And let's say dot com was the uh, development team and GE is basically the mobile team. Moving on. And this just shows you again how it looks like um, when we merge those things, the DNS zones. For the bodies points, uh, one concept that is muddy for me is the difference between iterative and recursive queries for DNS, specifically why one may be preferable to another and why there are different approaches in the first place. So here's what I got. Um, recursive and iterative DNS queries are queries that the client sends to, the ser to a server in order to find one, the IP address of a particular domain name, second domain name, which is assigned to a particular IP address. So in the recursive resolution, um, approach, uh, the client would ask, let's say the, um, the, the, the .edu server, th.edu server or the.edu server. And if the server doesn't know that, it basically asks the edu server and the edu server, doesn't, if it doesn't know that as well, it, sent, it requests to another server called uh, csu.edu server. And if csu.edu server knows that and can resolve the query, it would now send the reply to back to the servers and then uh, to the client. In the iterative resolution, uh, the client would ask one server. If the server doesn't know it, it would let the client know and the client would ask a, a different server. So instead of server asking another server, the client would just ask another server. Uh, that, that's already um, answering the question. Um, hypertext transfer protocol. It's a protocol for distributed collaborative hypermedia information systems. It operates in a client server mode and it's the underlying protocol used by the World Wide Web. Its port number is 80. And HTTP is stateless, used for communication between servers and client. It has requests and response. A good example would be you, um, hitting up a URL and loading a page or submitting a form when you're signing up for an account. HTTP has methods. Uh, there's get, retrieves data from the server. Let's say you um, enter facebook.com, you want to uh, get to see your profile, you're basically uh, asking a get request. Post request is 
basically submitting data to the server. Um, when you sign up for a new account, you're submitting using a form. And when you hit submit, it makes a post request to the server and stores your data. And for the put method, it's basically you have an existing data and you want to edit this one. Uh, think of it like um, you already uh, posted a comment in Facebook or Twitter, tweeted something, and you want to edit that field. And basically editing that data is updating that, and that would be now reflected to the server. Deleting it is basically just deleting your data in any form, and it will also request to delete that to the server. Here's a, uh, a good example, which you can use for your team project for the network diagram. The left side shows you uh, devices, which is um, computers, users, mobile. And if the computer is um, doing an HTTP request, it goes to the Route 53, which is the DNS. Um, and now it would access the website and uh, squirrelbin.com would now look for the S3 storage to load up that web page. And there's another case here if the device is sending a RESTful um, and to a RESTful endpoint and make a request there. Um, this now goes to this yellow icon called the um, uh, gateway. Uh, and then in this gateway, you can now have the get, post, get, put, delete, and whatever. And so that it will invoke different Lambda functions, which is um, function, uh, as a, um, function as a service. Meaning if I do get, I invoke that squirrel bin dash list, if I invoke a post, uh, that's basically the squirrel bin dash create and so on and so forth. And that Lambda function would now call my DynamoDB, which is a NoSQL database. So HTTP requests also have um, headers that goes along with it. Uh, on the left hand side, you would see the method and the path and also the protocol, which is HTTP 1.1. Uh, and it also has this different headers, host, user agent, like uh, what application are you using to create that request, um, that's user agent, uh, cookie for the um, sessions, uh, cache control, whether it's no, no cache or there's cache. On uh, the right hand side, the general request, uh, headers would be the request URL, request method, status code, 200, 400, Remote address, refer policy, response is basically what you get from the server. Uh, the cookie as well, the content type could be HTML, could be uh, JSON. Uh, request could also have the cookies, user agent, content type, again, HTML, JSON, or other uh, content types. For the status codes, we do have the informational, which is the hundreds, uh, success for the 200s, 300s for the redirects, 400 for the client error and 500 for the server error. So um, we mostly encounter this 400 client error when we are requesting uh, a certain page that does not exist. And basically it means that we're requesting someone, we're, we're requesting something. So, and then that request is missing something or ha um, requesting for something that does not exist would now return that, hey, I don't know how to handle this. so the server would give back a 400 client error. In another case, if you're requesting for something like, uh, let's say the homepage of your profile and it exists, and for some reason the server is down, it will now send you a 500 server error request. So the request has no problem, the server has some problem. For informational, again, we don't see this often as it's part of the processing success. We do have this all the time, but we just don't see it just because um, when we load the web page, we just um, use it. But if you click, uh, right click inspect, you would see that there's a status code success. Redirect is basically when you access a URL and you get to be redirected to a different site. So that's a, a redirect. On the right hand side, this is just a simple summary. 200s are the okay, 300s are the redirect. 400s are the bad requests, unauthorized, not found. 500 is the internal server error. So what's the difference between HTTP 1.1 and HTTP 2? Uh, HTTP 1, basically when it opens up a connection, it will do a get request for the uh, HTML file. 
server will respond. Now the client would request for the styles.css and server would respond. And then client would request for the scripts, the JavaScript file, and the server would respond. Page gets rendered, connection is closed. So in HTTP2, it gets to be faster. With multiplexing, now you open the connection, you request for HTML, you respond, uh, server respond with the uh, file. And when you're requesting for styles, you can also request for the scripts. And now you get the response both at the same time and page gets rendered, connection remains open. So HTTPS, it's uh, basically HTTP and secure. Um, data encrypted during in transit to then you have this SSL and TLS. So SSL and TLS is basically secure sockets layer and transport layer security. Both of them simply refer to the handshake that takes place between a client and a server. And as you can see in the OSI model, um, the SSL TLS um, is part of the application layer and goes along with your HTTP. And the good things about this is it prevents intruders from tampering. Uh, in security, there's a CIA model, confidentiality, integrity, availability. Um, if your data is tampered, it's basically um, losing the integrity of that data, which we don't want. Um, preventing intruders from passively listening is eavesdropping. Um, that now um, the, um, is a, has an impact to the confidentiality part of the data, which we don't want people accessing uh, data that they shouldn't have because they don't have the correct um, uh, access rights. Uh, cons for that, basically, it's more secure, but it would definitely add latency. Uh, Handshake is very resource intensive. Uh, it will also add complexity to your server management instead of directly communicating. You now have to uh, get certificates and uh, link it up with the certificate authority and stuff like that. So for the demo, I'm going to show you uh, curl dev DevTools with the network and HTTP requests using browser and Postman and Express.js for the application. So this is basically me accessing Twitter and my profile, as you can see, the slash DJ Jason Clark. And with the inspect, right click inspect, I would access the Chrome Dev Tools and in the network section, I can basically have show all of the files. I hit refresh again and shows the files that I'm loading. Um, I can check the JS files, CSS, images, media, font, doc, and this is basically my profile. And as you can see, uh, it shows the status code, method of request, which is get, the URL. And not only it has that, it also includes the response header, which we talked about, which is a cache control, the content type, which is an HTML type, and so forth. Another thing that we can um, see is the response is basically the HTML and CSS JavaScript that we got from the server. I'll introduce you to a good tool with uh, Postman. Postman is basically, um, it's like your browser as well, it's a client, and you can basically create a request here, let's say IS306, and create a collection, IS306. And we'll do the same, with the get request here on the left side, and send that, we should essentially see the same thing. The headers, text HTML, the status codes, the time, the size, and the body here, which the HTML file we got. So um, I'll show you another example as well. Uh, this time around, um, I'm gonna put up a local server using Express, and I'll load that up. So this one, just um, don't worry about a lot of things, is basically uh, importing the Express and using that, defining what port we wanna use. Um, uh, don't. Uh, think about this one for now and this one basically is making a get request 
with the slash, meaning the root or the home page for some. And what we want to do is um, say hello. So when we when someone requests to our server, it, we would respond with hello. You can make this like then node app.js and now the server is listening or open we can go back to here to see the local host 5000 and we see that hello go to chrome dev tools again network and see that we do have a status code of 200 and these are the header it's the html uh get requests 200 okay and we go back to the postman local host uh, 5000 let's see And we got the hello as well, uh, and as well as the header. And we can change it up to an HTML file by sending this one with the HTML tag. Uh, refresh. Run our server again. Refresh this one. Now we got an HTML file. Content type should still be the same though. This one. Get request. Go to Postman, hit send. I should still see the same thing. If I want to send a JSON, I have to do this stuff. And basically have a JSON object here. Uh, JSON is basically JavaScript object notation uh, that you can send data with your HTTP or HTTPS protocol. Let's restart the server. And now I see a JSON uh, data here and send that as well. And now, as you can see, the head content type header is now application slash JSON. So with that, we'll want to show you this code with now with the post request. Um, if the uh, user inputs the local host slash local host um, 5000 slash contact if it receives any body like the, uh, a content um, it would return that um, here says thank you for that body let's say okay um, if not uh, it would say name is required so let's make this better so our body should have a name property so if we go to postman let's say we do contact and make sure it's in post request we go to the body hit this um, xww form encoded um, and the key is name and the value is clark and let's see the header should be um, i think that should be fine and now it responds with my thank you clark we will also show you uh, first, this is a database uh, with um, a NoSQL database called MongoDB, and it's provided by MongoDB at last as the cloud solution. If I click collection, I would see a JSON data here. Uh, and the way that uh, we can have this is, again, data is being passed around JSON with the HTTP protocol. And what I can do is basically access my front end. Let me go to that. And my front end should be, again, going back here, I have JSON object, key value pairings, title, ISBN, author, picture, right? So here, let's go to my S3 first. And in my S3 bucket called bookstore. And let's see properties, uh, static web hosting, access this endpoint. 
So this one is a mean stack technology. It has MongoDB, uh, Express as a framework for back end, uh, Angular as the front end, and Node as the runtime environment for the back end. So this is what you're seeing is basically the Angular application that contacts a back end, which um, the back end is, um, I'll show you, it's basically here. The backend is hosted in EZ2 instance, which is again just a server uh, with Amazon and this Ubuntu instance. I need to first go to my application, which is that one. This is where it lives, and just make my server open or start listening. Now, my backend is open this can now communicate, right? And another thing, that, that's basically a get request, get me all the book. And when I hit edit, this is basically a put request. Uh, and when I hit save, it's gonna do a put request to my back end, which is again, this one. And that one would now process that in the database. Uh, create a database to do that and it should update that now to introduction to database great how about a post request again post request we usually see a form so an example would be introduction to uh, TypeScript ISBN whatever order let's say Clark and let's give a price first and let's see a TypeScript um, book um, let's grab a TypeScript book Copy image address. Uh, let's open that up first. And this is making a post request to the back end and the back end would now uh, update or request to the database to process that query and update as you can see with this one introduction to TypeScript. And lastly, I would wanna show you a delete request. I hit delete. That gets processed, refresh this one, and my database should have that, okay? So this is MeanStack. It basically uses a single page application. Single page application basically has a different components. And older technologies, which is the multi-page application, if you do something like edit, request, it basically loads the whole page, but with single page application, it's just tries to load the component and this time around, whenever I do a uh, get, post, put, delete, it just updates this part. It doesn't need to update the navigation as, a bit as well or refresh. Uh, another thing that I'd like, to, uh, I'd like to extend is, basically after single page application, you can make it to a progressive web app. And this is my progressive web app. And what's, uh, one of the features is basically the offline capability. So let me go back to the other Facebook. Uh, uh, yep. So if I turn my Wi-Fi off, if I refresh this single page application, it says no internet. For my uh, progressive web app, it shows this icon that I don't have internet, but I can basically refresh this and still have the data. Don't mind this image, but it basically cached that. Okay, and um, the reason for that is basically when I inspect this one, I go to my application, I have service workers um, and the local storage, the caching storage. Um, these COD means the create, update, delete book. Uh, read storage is basically this one. If I become offline, I'll basically wanna grab the data from this local storage in my browser. So that's the cool thing about Progressive Web App. Another cool thing about it is you can actually uh, download this application. Um, another cool feature for Progressive Web App is for, let's say Pinterest, Facebook, Twitter before is you, you have to create an app for your web and an app for your mobile and put that in the Play Store or App Store and have to develop those separately. With Progressive Web App, you just create a web app and now you can click this one and open 
and that's basically the mobile version and if you access this in your mobile phone it also would uh, have that icon that enables you to hey do you want to download this application and now would be added to your home screen and would look like this okay you don't even need the play store for that one i'll use the remaining time to search up some <coughs> network diagrams and hopefully gives you give you a very simple explanation oh, let's have some simple ones So even just by Googling, you can find uh, easy to read diagrams such as this one. As you can see, the very outer box, you have the virtual private cloud, which when you use a service in Amazon, basically you're enclosed in one virtual private cloud. And what you do is you have a bunch of servers, services, database inside of it, and the only way uh, you can access it is basically creating a gateway. Think of it's your router, your default gateway. Again, your router in your home, and that's only the one that can be exposed. The port can be opened and be accessed from. So, Elastic Load Balancer, if you remember in our database class, we have load balancers to distribute the load of the database or the network as well. Um, instances, it's the words being used. If you have an instance of a server, EC2 instance is just saying, I have an AWS computer there. It could be Unix, it could be uh, Windows. Um, Amazon DynamoDB is a popular NoSQL database by Amazon. MySQL. You, already got, you guys know about that already. Subnets, basically uh, your IP address in that, um, it's like zone, a zone. Let's check for other simple. Let's see. So for this one, an example would be, again, for the internet and your domain, uh, to be able to access that, you have your EC2 instance, and they attach an elastic IP, meaning they attach uh, an IP address from either Amazon's pool of IP address or your own IP address. And your EC2 instance is also connected to S3 bucket so that it's like I have a computer and I want to upload files to my Google Drive. It's like that. I have an EC2 instance. I want to upload <coughs> user big files to my S3 bucket. Let's see. How about this one? So with this one, You have Amazon Route 53, that's your DNS server. Uh, elastic load balancing, again, to balance the load, you can send either servers. And your EC2 instance, you have a security group to host your web application. <coughs> and then you can connect that to your S3 bucket. And you can also have a cloud front in front of it, which is what we talk about, a cloud, uh, a um, <coughs> content distribution network. Content distribution network is basically putting something closer to you so that you can um, get the files quickly. Let's see.
So most of the simple diagrams is the same. And as a suggestion, before you lock into one diagram or create one diagram, try to check the other diagrams and see what's the common thing that they do. Like for this example, again, you have AWS Cloud and inside of it, you have your Amazon Virtual Private Cloud. You have your Internet Gateway, VPN Gateway. You have your Availability Zones. Again, whether you're going to IT, development, business, it's very essential that you know this cloud technologies because it's everywhere. And I guess that's it for now. Um, take a quick break. Let me know if you have questions, whether for the project, your grades, whatever. <coughs> and let's, let's I'll let you guys decide. We can, yeah, I'll let you stay maybe 30, 40 minutes more after the break to work on your stuff and help you if you have questions. Again, it's easier to do the work now so that when you go home, you have less stuff to do, right, for your projects. <laughs>